Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading at verse 25, and this is what it says. It says, Even the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, look at what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise in the way the world judges wisdom. Not many of you had great influence. Not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose what the world thinks is unimportant and what the world looks down on and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. God did this so that no one can brag in His presence. Because of God, you are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. In Christ we are put right with God and have been made holy and have been set free from sin. So as the scripture says, if someone wants to brag, he should brag only about the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, may this day be one that, that we're changed, changed by your presence, changed by your spirit. Jesus changed Changed by you. Thank you for this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A fellow walked into a hearing aid store. A salesman came up to him and he said, uh, How much do your hearing aids cost? The salesman said, Well, they go all the way from $1.50 all the way up to $25,000. The man said, $25,000. He said, What do I receive for a hearing aid that, that costs $25,000? He said, Well, that hearing aid, it's made in Switzerland, has a lifetime warranty, and not only that, it translates into three different languages. The man said, Wow, that's impressive. Well, what do I receive with a hearing aid that costs $1.50? He said, Well, that hearing aid is a button with a wire attached to it. The man said, does it work? He said, no, not really. But you put the button in your ear and put the wire in your pocket. He said, you'll be surprised how loud people will talk. <laughs> the man said, well, you know, I, th I need to spare no expense at all. I'm going to buy that $25,000 hearing aid. Well, everywhere he went, he bragged that his hearing aid cost $25,000, that it was made in Switzerland, had a lifetime warranty, and could translate into three different languages. Somebody asked him, said, what kind is it? He said, oh, it's about 10 minutes till 5. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. It, it just doesn't pay to brag, does it? Oh, but people do love to brag. People love to brag. Paul is writing a letter to a, to a church where they love to brag. That he's, he's dealing with a problem here where some folks bragged that said, well, I follow Cephas. Others bragged, well, I follow Apollos. Others bragged, well, I follow Paul. Paul says, cut it out. Cephas didn't die for you on the cross. I didn't die for you on the cross. Apollos didn't die for you on the cross. Jesus died for you on the cross. Follow Jesus. And you folks that are, that are from that are Greeks, you all have, a, Paul's saying, you all have a long history of philosophy and wisdom, and you're proud of your wisdom. 
So you like to brag about the, the wisdom of the Greeks. And you folks that are, that are Jewish, you have a long history of moral purity and you like to brag about your moral purity. Cut it out. Because the foolishness of God, even the foolishness of God is wiser than the, the wisest wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strongest moral purity. Cut out the bragging. But then he ends it up by saying, but if you should brag, and he, bo he borrows this from the prophet Jeremiah, he says, but if you want to brag, brag about the Lord. Brag about God. Brag about what God's doing. I like that. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Something to brag about. To brag about God. And the first thing that I want to talk about is brag about his love. Brag about his love. Back in the mid-1950s, Bennett Cerf was uh, a well-known celebrity. He was on radio shows and television programs. He, was, um, he started up Random House Publishing and not only that, he was known as a humorist, an author, and he had a warm way about him, a warm sense of humor. So he would be on game shows, panel shows, discussion shows, um, because people were, were drawn to him. Well, one of the shows that he was on in the mid-50s was an NBC radio program called Conversations. That The show would pose a question to a panel of of people and they would would talk about the answer for 20 minutes I'm not real sure how well the show would go on today but they would talk about it on the radio for 20 minutes and and then they would propose an answer to the moderator well the question for the day was um, what do people fear the most what do people fear the most well it was the mid 1950s and the, the polio virus was, was running rampant. That they talked about that that was one of the greatest fears that people, were, that people had was that, that polio virus. And not only the polio virus, communism was something that people were very afraid of. Nuclear annihilation. And they talked about that for a while. At the end of the 20 minutes, the moderator turned to the panel and he said a strange thing. He said, well, Bennett, usually you're right in the middle of this discussion. And uh, he said, you haven't talked much at all today. And that's when, very thoughtfully, Bennett Surf said, well, what I was thinking in some ways seems kind of trivial. It's very different. He said, I think what people are most afraid of is not being loved. That's the first human emotion that's mentioned in the Bible. That God's looking for Adam, and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid, for I was afraid. That Adam was afraid that because he'd done what God told him not to do, that God wouldn't love him. Adam hid for because he was afraid what God might do, that he might not be accepted by God. I think it's... Maybe the most universal fear that folks have, not being loved, not being accepted, not being received. Well, when Jesus set out to say the best thing he could about God, John 3, 16, he said, God so loved the world. Not that God tolerated the world, that God was it was set to destroy the world. No, that God so loved the world. And Jesus didn't stop right there. He said, God so loved the world that he gave. Now, the way most of us are, that we don't give until we're sure that it'll be received. That, but God gave not just something to see if folks would receive it. Not just a little something to see if they would warm up to it. He gave what was most precious. He gave his only begotten son. And he didn't wait till folks re received him. He says he gave his only begotten son that whoever. Now, God so loved the world starts off with what's most general. But whoever goes down to what's most specific. 
that whoever believes in him. Now, sometimes we trip over that word believe because in English, believe has so much to do with what goes on in the, in the head. But this was first, first written in, in Greek, and, and believe and faith have the same root. The word pistis or pistuos, it means the same thing. And it's not what goes on in your head that, that believe or faith, pistuos, pistis, it's, it's a word that, well, it means quite literally to lean on, to rely on, to trust in. That it's, it's the kind of, of, of trust that comes because you know someone, you have confidence in them, you can lean on them. You, it's a relationship that's been, been built with someone so you can rely on them. You can trust them. Well, this is the relationship that, that Jesus is pointing to for, for you and for me, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, whoever leans on, whoever relies on, whoever trusts in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now that eternal life so often we think is, is years added on after we die. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Eternal life is a quality of life, a texture of life that that starts right in the here and now, right now today, and this quality, this texture, it goes on forever. Jesus, when praying to God, in John chapter 17, verse 3, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That it's his love that we brag on in our prayer. It's his love that we brag on. And and we begin to see that that his love everywhere we turn in the world around us all during the day. It's his love that we brag on. And maybe to those that we're we're closest to, we begin to to share and brag on that that love. And, And you know, once we get to that point, You'll be surprised the conversations, even with strangers, that you begin to brag about the love of God. Who loved you and me before we did a thing. Before we did a thing. Brag about his love. Brag about his love. But not only that, brag about his forgiveness. 1 Corinthians 30, this is what it says, and I read it already this morning. It says, in Christ we are put right with God, we have been made holy and we have been set free from sin. Put right, made holy, and set free. Those are all God's actions. Those aren't our actions. We've been put right with God, made holy, and set free. What Jesus did on the cross for you and for me, he did what we couldn't do for ourselves. He put us right with God. That on the cross, He forgave all that's past, all that's present, and all that would be. He wiped it away once and for all. He forgave us. And he made us holy. When he rose from the grave, he chose to live his life through through you and me. That we receive him and, and he begins to change, to transform us. To make us new again as his life is is lived through us. And not only that, it's in that that transformation that he, he breaks the chains of sin. He sets us free from sin is what it says. All those things that would crush us, all those things that would destroy us, all those things that would defeat us, when he, he nailed to the cross, he killed them all. And as he lives his life through us, that we're set free. We're set free from them. Not by our power, but by his. And it's something to brag about that power. Something to brag about his power of forgiveness in prayer. To brag about that power to all during the day, through everything that we see. To brag about his power to forgive us, even us. And we can share it with those that are closest, that we, that we love the most. And before long, before you know it, 
bragging about his power to forgive, well, it comes up even with strangers, even to those folks that that we don't know well. But too often, folks, folks haven't received that forgiveness. I've got a good friend named Bob Christopher. He has a radio program that's on AM 590. It's called Basic Gospel. And folks call into his show, and he and his team answer questions about the Bible that they have. And one day, Bob and I were talking, and I said, what's the number one question that people have? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, the number one question people have is, can I be forgiven? They know that, yes, God forgives sins, but they feel like that there's something they've done that's beyond his forgiveness, that's beyond his grace. And he says again and again and again, individuals call up wanting to know, can, can I be forgiven? Is what I've done, can, can God really forgive me? I tried to think up an illustration that might help us in receiving that forgiveness. Imagine for a minute that you go on vacation and you paid somebody to cut your grass while you were gone, but you didn't know it the first day that you left that they got sick, went to the hospital, they weren't able to cut your grass. And you come back, they're all right, but your lawn's not, that it's grown up about calf high. And you're wondering, what are you going to do? That you've got to, got to make sure that your grass is cut down in some way, but you don't want to scalp it all where it kills all the grass. And you remember that your neighbor has, has offered his John Deere riding mower to you. And he's offered several times without you asking, but you've never taken, it, taken him up on the offer. Well, now's the day that you know you need that, that riding mower that he has. And so you start to walk across your grass. And as you walk through it and it's calf eye, you, you, you're just irritated by the thought of having to, to cut this grass. And that's when his dog comes out to greet you. Well, you love dogs, but this dog, it's a dachshund. Well, you know how dachshunds are. I, I know I... I know how dachshunds are. I used to have dachshunds. And they're kind of snippy, kind of bitey, kind of yappy. They like to get in your way. And, and, and this dog, he howls all night. He's messed up your yard before. And, and so as you're walking across through this thick grass, the dog's right there, and you give him a little punt. And that's when you look up and you see your neighbor. He's standing on his front porch, and he's watched the whole thing. Well, you might want to do a little work before you start asking, asking for what he's already offered. Well, this work, this work is called repentance. It's not a demand of his forgiveness. It's not a demand that goes up there requesting. It's humbly, humbly asking for what he's already offered. That it, it starts in the relationship. It starts in the, the relationship that's built on, well, it's built on trust. On leaning on. On relying. Now, no illustration's perfect. But so often we want to receive His forgiveness without repenting. Without turning, without humbly coming clean. That's hard to do. And, and the problem isn't God. The problem is that it's in the receiving of it. It's in the receiving of it. Know that God is what, what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. It was enough to forgive all that's past. But to receive it, we, it's required that we come to him humbly in prayer. And we brag on his forgiveness, not our repentance. We brag on his forgiveness to all during the day. That in gratitude, we, we share with those that we're closest to his forgiveness, not our strength. That it's, that it even comes up with those that, 
maybe you're hurting around us. And that we don't have to share the, the, the theology of all the Christian faith only in what God's done for you and for me. That forgiveness. It may be the most universal fear that folks have. Can God really love me? Can God really forgive me? You've got something to brag about. You've got something to brag about. Brag about his forgiveness. Brag about his love. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is brag about his children. Read a story <laughs> that President H.W. Bush was going into a nursing home. He came into the nursing home and there was an old fellow standing in the, the, the hall. He went up to, to greet the gentleman and he looked him straight in the eye in a very gentle and winsome way. He reached out and shook the man's hand. The man made eye contact with him and and that's when President Bush said, do you know me? And that's when the old man looked at him in the eyes. He said, no, but if you go to the nurse at the front desk, she can tell you. <laughs> well, I, I, the rest of the world, people don't see things quite the way we do. Sometimes people don't see the world way, the way we do. They don't experience the, way the, the world the way that we do. But that doesn't mean that we can't love them. It doesn't mean that we can't build them up. It doesn't mean that we can't encourage them. It doesn't mean that we can't brag on them. It doesn't mean that we can't brag on them. Fred Craddock tells a story about a missionary named Oswald Coulter. Excuse me, Golter. He was a missionary to, to China. And after 10 years, his mission board had sent him a passage money for passage to come back home after 10 years well he made his way to India he was there in the port and he was waiting to to get passage on the way home he had the ticket but he had heard that there were some refugees there in the port that were living in a warehouse that they'd made their way to India but there weren't many countries there in the 1940s that that would accept them into their country they were waiting there in the warehouse, and, and this missionary, Oswald Golter, went, went into the, the warehouse. It was Christmas time, and, and he, he greeted them with Merry Christmas. They said, we're not Christians. He said, okay, well, I, I just wanted to let you know that, that I, I wanted to see how you're doing. I knew you had been stuck here for a while. What, what can I get you for Christmas? They said, well, we're not Christians. We don't believe in Christmas. He said, okay. He said, but is there something that you'd like? Something that I can do for you? And well, after talking with them for a while, they said, you know, one of the things we, we really miss, we really, there's, a, there's a German pastry that we really, we really do like. Well, they were in India, but Oswald Golter decided he'd go out into the city, see if there was a bakery that could make these, these German pastries these German baked goods. And sure enough, found a baker that could. Well, he cashed in his, his ticket home and he purchased baskets and baskets of pastries for, for these refugees that were there in the port. He gave them to them and they, they enjoyed these, these pastries and these baked goods so much. Well, many years later, Oswald Golter had told this story and, to his students and one of his students said, Sir, why? Why did you do that? They, they didn't even believe in Jesus. And that's when Oswald Golter said, No, they didn't, but, but I do. It's not necessary for folks to see the world the way we do. It's not necessary for folks to believe the way that we believe, to think and act the way that, that, that we think that they should. It's not necessary in order for us to love them. In order for us to encourage them. In order for us to build them up. In order for us to brag on them. Jesus put it this way in John 13, 35. He says, by this all people shall know that you are my disciples. That you have love for one another. That you have love. The world we live in right now 
It's not bragging about God's love. It's not bragging about God's forgiveness. It's not bragging about God's children. No, the world we live in right now, it's, it's set to dividing us, to polarizing us, to underscoring our differences. But Jesus is calling us to something different. Jesus says the way that they'll know his disciples is by the love that we have. By the way that that we build one another up. Encourage one another. The way that even those that are different don't believe like us, don't think like us, don't act the way that, that we do that we can love them as well. Well, we can't do that on our own. That it's the power of the risen Christ living through you and me that gives us strength that, well, it's, frankly, it's strength that, that we don't have. And we can love, we can encourage, we can build up, we can brag on His children. This morning... It may be that when I begin to talk about his love, that that's not something that you've bragged about, not in your prayer life, not during the day. Something that you haven't been able to see because it's not something, his love is something that you haven't bragged on, not even with those that you're closest to. And maybe that his forgiveness, you thought it was for somebody else, but it's not something that you've received for yourself and that you've got some work to do know that he's he started that work long before you said yes that you humbly humbly you can can lean on him humbly you can rely on him humbly you can repent and trust that what Jesus did on the cross that it's enough Enough that, that, that you and I might receive that forgiveness, that he began to, to live his life in us, and, and we begin to be transformed, changed, different than we were yesterday, even yesterday. And we can begin to brag on his children. We can begin to love those that are maybe there in your own home, maybe there close by. There that those people that maybe this world has, has set it, it polarizing you from, underscoring their differences, setting you against, that you can begin to love and brag on them. Well, I want to pray with you this morning. I want to pray with you just for that, that the power of the risen Christ. Pray with me. Jesus, you rose from the grave that your spirit might live in us. It's a Holy Spirit that has a strength we don't have, a power we don't have. The quality of eternity living in us that, well, that we don't have on our own. Not one day, but this day. Lord, breathe that power through us that we might be transformed. We might be made different. That we might have a strength. A strength to love in a way that we've never loved before. That we might brag on your love in our prayer, your forgiveness. We might brag on your children in prayer. During the day, to those we're closest to, and, and Lord, that bragging might come up. Come up all during the day, even to those who are strangers. Lord, this is impossible in our own strength. But we know that even your weakness is greater than our greatest strength. That your wisdom, your foolishness is greater than our greatest wisdom. And it's the, your strength and wisdom that we call on this day. By the power of the risen Christ, may we receive it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. 
Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.